salt territory which is more than 25 beads. The Americans call a silent pattern or a flat trace if it is not to three beads, hardly any variability. If I put a fetal ECG or maternal ECG, the whole trace is flat. That means the heart is not working. Same way if you put it on the CTG and the trace is flat, that means the autonomic nervous system is not working. Probably the baby has already got a severe damage, either due to hemorrhage or some other insult. So that has to be noted very carefully and look for any particular injury. Now we will turn to the mechanism of deceleration. We have spoken the mechanism of the baseline rate, the variability and the accelerations. Now turning to decelerations, we have to understand the perfusion very well. The perfusion, as you could see here, the aorta takes the blood to the uterus and uh, the inferior vena cava brings it back. And you can see the two umbilical arteries are pumping deoxygenated blood into the placenta and the umbilical vein is bringing the oxygenated blood back. So as long as this is smooth, it goes on with a steady baseline. If the mother lies on her back and compresses the inferior vena cava, the venous return is reduced, the cardiac output is reduced, therefore the perfusion is affected, the baby tries to compensate with a tachycardia. On the other hand, if the aorta is blocked, then it compensates by a bradycardia. Recently there was a publication, I don't know whether you have read, that we are encouraging mothers to sleep on their left lateral side by putting some pillows because they have checked and found there is a slight increase in stillbirths in mothers who lie on their back and sleep. The numbers are very tiny but quite an interesting observation. But nevertheless, talking about the fetal heart rate pattern, so if you find an increase in heart rate, you put the mother on the side and it'll be all right. Now, early decelerations are one of the benign decelerations due to head compression in the late first stage and second stage of labor. So you can see there's an arrow here and the heart rate is steady, there is no contraction here. And as the contraction starts and the pressure on the head builds up, there's a gradual fall of the heart rate and the maximal pressure with the maximal contraction of the lowermost heart rate and as the pressure is relieved, the heart rate gradually goes back and back to the baseline. So it starts with the contraction and ends with the contraction. The UK, we call it early deceleration. The Americans call it head compression deceleration. And head compression deceleration should not appear in early labor. It should be in the late first stage or second stage of labor. And looking at this recording, you can see the number of contraction with the pushing spikes and if you draw a line, they should come within that line. And the deceleration don't come below 40 beats. But in the second stage, you can get variable deceleration due to head compression. Because I mentioned to you the vagus nerve innervates the orbital region. So if the baby is slightly deflexed with occipital posterior, with the application of pressure and the head going down, the heart rate can drop and remain for some time and then pick it up. Those are also variable because they varies in shape and size, but those are due to head compression, which are slightly different configuration compared to cord compression. And I'll come to that in a minute. So we are looked at early. There's another one called late deceleration, which starts 20 seconds later than the contraction. So if I draw a line, it is 20 seconds later. So the mechanism of this is when the uterus starts contracting, it is using the retroplacental pool of blood and the heart rate is maintained. But if there is IUGR or post-term or infection or bleeding and the placental interface is not good enough, it doesn't fill up with blood very quickly. So the baby starts this decelerative response due to baroreceptor mechanism. But if the blood fills up very quickly, the heart rate goes up. So the characteristics of the late deceleration uh, if you draw a line of from the onset of the contraction, the onset of the deceleration is 20 seconds late, or the contraction apex is 20 seconds later, and the nadir of the deceleration is 20 seconds later than the apex of the contraction. So Britain, we call it late decelerations. The Americans call it placental insufficiency deceleration. That doesn't mean the patient needs cesarean section. You put on the side, and the decelerations might disappear with improved perfusion. You give her some 
IV fluids because it increases the placental perfusion. You reduce the oxytocin. So you can do a number of things to alleviate the problem. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, deliver the baby because of late decelerations. So as you could see, this can come repeatedly, but you must try to overcome by that one. If you're using prostaglandin like misoprostol or any prostaglandin E2, there is a good possibility that it might get rapidly absorbed because the absorption of prostaglandin will depend not only on the dose and the media with which you give like gel or film or tablet, but also on the moisture content of the vagina, the temperature of the vagina, the pH of the vagina, all will influence the absorption of the prostaglandin. If it has a tetanic contraction, it'll have a bradycardia, and if it doesn't resolve, now we have a thing called the propase pessary in the UK, which you can take it out, but still if the contractions are continuing, we give terbitaline 0.25 milligrams subcutaneously. You can give small doses of salbutamol or nitroglycerine, what, whichever it is to relax the uterus. The NICE guidelines recommend terbitaline, which has been used mostly, 0.25 milligrams subcutaneously, but if you want to give it slow IV, you have to give it over five minutes, otherwise it'll cause severe hypotension. Now looking at cord compression, another reason for deceleration, the cord can be under the arm. There are two arteries which are thick wall and a vein which is thin wall. So with the contraction, the vein will get obliterated first. So here with the vein getting obliterated, the arteries are open, so the blood is being pumped outside the body. So the blood pressure drops due to a hypotension. Because the blood pressure drops, there is a slight increase in the heart rate, and that is called shouldering. And within seconds, the contractions increases in intensity and obliterates the artery. And when the artery is obliterated, it is pumping the blood against the closed artery. So the blood pressure builds up. And due to baroreceptor mechanism, there is a precipitous fall in the heart rate. And the onset of this change starts with the onset of the contraction. And when the contraction eases off, the arteries being thick-walled are released first. So the baby is pumping the blood out, so the heart rate picks up and overshoots because the vein is still open, uh, vein is still closed, and when the vein opens, the heart rate settles down to the normal. So a precipitous fall and a precipitous rise with shouldering is due to cord compression. Now I'll tell you there are atypical variable deceleration because in the same baby there might be placental insufficiency so although it is trying to recover, it might continue decelerating if there is placental insufficiency. So we will look at that later on. But depending on the compression of the cord and the movement of the arm, the shape and size of these decelerations will vary. So we call it variable decelerations. The Americans call it cord compression decelerations. As you could see here, the shape and size is varying because it depends on the pressure with which the cord gets compressed. Now I mentioned about atypical and typical variable. Typical is with the normal shouldering. Now if the baby has IUGR and oligohydramnios, it'll start with a variable. Because the placenta is small and there is placental insufficiency, there'll be a late deceleration. So when you combine both, we call it biphasic or a combined deceleration. If you connect both together, you call it a late recovery deceleration. And if things are getting worse, the depth and duration is more than 60 seconds. And at the beginning sometimes, the heart rate pumps faster in order to get the oxygen back, and we call it overshoot, which we call it pre-pathological. So anything other than the normal variable is called atypical variable decelerations. This has connotations because these babies with atypical variable deceleration run into trouble much earlier compared to the typical variable deceleration. But you take into consideration the baseline rate, the baseline variability, and how the baseline rate is going up. Now in addition to all these acceleration, decelerations, and variability, there are additional patterns we have to learn about. Sinusoidal, I'll talk to you a little bit more in detail. There are two types. Atypical sinusoidal means there is no uniformity. Typical is actually there is uniformity, 
and any chronic form of anemia like power virus infection or a rhesus isoimmunization, you get this type of typical sinusoidal, but if there is acute bleeding like vasa previa or fetal maternal hemorrhage, you get atypical sinusoidal pattern. Now sinusoidal pattern can be also due to physiological reasons. Somebody, the baby is sucking its thumb, it can cause sinusoidal. So we must know how to distinguish one from the other. So I'll talk about it in a few minutes. So if you really take the heart rate changes we discuss about acceleration, decelerations, the rate and the variability, they all can be modified by drugs like pethidine and valium can reduce it. Betamethasone, dexamethasone can reduce the variability for 24 to 48 hours. Temperature can increase the heart rate. So if the mother has fever, that heart rate, baby's heart rate will go up. External stimuli, as I mentioned, head compression can give rise to early deceleration. Hypoxia, if it is an acute hypoxia, like an abruption, it'll be a profound body cardia, but otherwise it might be a rise in baseline rate. So changes in the placental blood flow, and also fetal activity, the baby is moving a lot, there'll be tachycardia, and we should be able to differentiate a tachycardia from a false impression of deceleration. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So essentially what we are trying in the pathophysiology is to detect hypoxia, which can happen with reduced cord blood flow. You